welcome to the Justice Room on Friday morning, the last day of the conference. Um, you've, you, some of you have probably been in the Justice Room before, but for the benefit of those who haven't, um, this has been a room hosted by Shared Assets and Land in Our Names. And it's specifically for issues around justice and a dedicated safe space within the conference for people who are oppressed or marginalised within the agricultural system. Um, for that reason, we'd like you to uphold the ethos of justice and please be respectful of one another throughout this session. Um, so today we have a talk on why is connecting urban and rural food systems important for a just transition. Um, and to deliver this amazing session, we've got Kennedy from Platform, we've got Sinead from Orside Farm, and we've got Kim from Shared Assets. Also in the room, we have Dora, who is going to be um, a wellbeing contact. So if anything comes up for people and you'd like to talk to someone, Dora's the person to go to, just find her in the chat. Um, and we also have a Yana who's going to be on tech issues. So if you have anything, any problems, then please reach out to Yana. And yeah, I, I think that's it. So I'll hand over to Kennedy to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Hi, everyone. Um, hello. Welcome to the last day of the conference and the Justice Forum. Um, I'm actually very honoured to be chairing this session on why is connecting urban and rural food systems important for a just transition. It's very broad and a big topic um, and we haven't got all the time in the world so I'm looking forward to getting into it. Um, <clears throat> just to explain the format of the session, um, I'm the chair, I'll be facilitating the discussion and we'll be hearing from our speakers Kim and Sinead for opening remarks um, and then uh, I'll be asking follow-up questions um, and then we'll get a chance to go into breakout spaces of three and four to um, discuss what we've heard. Then we'll come back all together and we'll have a discussion, comments, questions that we'll discuss together and then we'll, we'll close. But before we get to the speakers, I just want to introduce them and um, because they are great. Um, so <clears throat> firstly, we have Kim. Um, Kim, uh, pronouns are they, them, uh, they are, um, and is the research coordinator at Shared Assets, a think and do tank, working to create a socially just future through practical projects that build new relationships between people and land. Kim is interested in using participatory and peer research to build collective knowledge about the impacts and of stewarding land for the common good. In doing so, they help to support the movement for land justice to improve practice, influence policy, strengthen local um, and national networks and bolster our advocacy. They are currently undertaking research on topics including rural regeneration, peri urban and urban growing, um, soil care and supporting new entrants into farming. Kim has a master's in agroecology and food security and is keen and is a keen community gardener who loves any excuse to get their hands in the soil. Um, welcome Kim. Um, and next we have Sinead. Uh, Sinead is a first generation farmer growing organic culinary herbs, edible flowers and vegetables on a small holding in East Essex. Sinead has a background in natural resources as an ex-geologist uh, and previously worked within the mining industry, um, but turned a passion for uh, earth sciences into land-based regeneration work focused on food and farming and now works to turn an ex-arable conventionally farmed field into an agroecological, agroecological, organic <laughs> food and flower growing business that focuses on wildlife and building communities. She has worked within food policy with the Food Research Co uh, Collaboration and is currently a director at the uh, Eastbourne Food Partnership working towards making um, Eastbourne a sustainable food city. Welcome speakers. Um, Okay, so um, firstly, we're going to hear from um, Kim, who's going to have open remarks. So I'll leave it to you, Kim. Go for it. Thanks, Kennedy. And yeah, excited to be with everyone this morning and yeah, getting a bit of a discussion going, but I'll, I'll get started with a, a few thoughts of mine. So yeah, like Kennedy said, uh, at Shared Assets, we've kind of been involved in some research uh, work recently around rural regeneration through this um, project called Ruralization and ruralization is a bit of a made up term, but it's kind of thinking about 
what would it look like to have a bit of a counterforce to urbanization? Um, so instead of you know people moving away from rural areas for jobs and opportunities, what would it what would need to be in place for more people to want to come to rural areas and have good good lives and meaningful work there and build communities? And a lot of the work that we've been doing, especially with partners across Europe, has been uh, around access to land, which I'm sure most of you realise is like a crucial crucial issue in all of this. But it's made us think. I think a bit broad, more broadly about what the sort of relationships and um, processes and things that need to be in place for, yeah, for people to have good lives in rural areas might be. And I think, yeah, I really, I was excited to be invited to, to talk at this uh, panel, particularly thinking about just transition, because I think those principles are, are yeah, just at like the core of, of kind of what a, a good process of ruralization might look like. And I think for me, um, you know, the system, thinking about the food system in particular, like the food system that we have at the minute is so entangled in histories of colonialism and enslavement and enclosure, um, you know, and, and on, on an ongoing basis is still rooted in those sort of patterns in terms of, uh, you know, the inequalities of global trade and things like that, that I think if we're going to, if we're going to move through to, uh, put into reality those principles of a just transition we have to do things in a different way and we have to we have to think about forms of reparation and how we can move forwards um together in a more equitable way um so yeah i think we have to look at those root causes and that's why it's kind of important uh, to connect urban and rural communities and the food system is just one way to do that so we have to move away from this sort of system now where we have a lot of agriculture and our food system based on extraction and exploitation of people of you know the more than human of our natural world um and also of, of uh, a place where a lot of people are alienated from the land and from where their food comes from who produces it how it how it comes to be on supermarket shelves and things like that um so we need to move away from that towards these um towards a different system, towards a different uh, world that we want to see. And I think the sort of principles of a just transition are, are key in that. So I'd say um, forming kind of relationships of solidarity, like real meaningful, deep relationships between urban and rural communities is, is key in this. And I think loads of these, these the ways that this could happen have been touched on already in different parts of um, the ORFC and I know that work is ongoing you know in all sorts of different ways and means for some time but just to pick out a couple of kind of examples as they relate to the food system in particular um I was thinking about kind of you know what would it look like if the the sort of you know often migrant workers who work in kind of intensive horticulture um were connected with the people who buy that sort of food in in urban areas what would it mean for you know those workers to have sort of meaningful work and good and healthy lives in the in the more rural situations they're in but also to to support and have relationships with the people who rely on that cheap food in more urban areas and then another one which i think has come up kind of a lot with covid especially at the start was this sort of there seemed to be a kind of trend of like uh, urban flight I guess a bit and like especially more affluent people from urban areas kind of going out to escape the city escape the virus a bit um to to go more into rural areas and that leading to a whole range of kind of different impacts for people who already lived in those rural areas um you know pushing up rents in terms of you know food like pushing up the prices of agricultural land because if land in rural areas is seen just as a space for kind of uh tourism and recreation and less as a sort of productive working environment then that's going to push up the prices of land even more away from what's affordable for an uh, agricultural sort of uh, living to just something that's you know set at a price suitable for kind of speculation for holiday homes and things like that um so yeah what would it mean if if those kind of groups of like existing rural communities and people who want to you know have the benefits of a good good life or a good time in the in the countryside what if they could have a meaningful relationship together what would that look like um about building a sense of community and not just uh for the countryside to be like a place to run away to when when times get tough in the city um and i think 
something I so I went to the the talk yesterday morning on the Indian farmer struggle and I find it yeah really inspiring and like the, something that we could learn a lot from here in terms of connecting up rural and urban communities especially around food and the the speakers there were talking a lot about how um the support from urban populations like especially sort of urban middle classes um with the 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 farmers who'd come to the city to protest was absolutely key in in the successes that they that they had so it was about kind of making the 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 fights and the issues of the farmers everybody's issues because they're about food you know they're they were the people who feed the cities and that was kind of how they were viewed in a really positive way so everybody's survival was kind of bound up with each other's and that was really that solidarity was really crucial in in the wins that um that happened and i think also broadening it broadening it out from um yeah they said broadening it out from an issue that was just about agriculture to kind of the world that we want to see more generally that was also crucial to 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 their successes that they had so i think there's a lot we could learn from there about how we bring together urban and rural communities maybe through the food system initially but um it can expand out uh, to to yeah much broader processes of the just transition um and i think yeah well throughout the course of today we're going to get into lots of the ways that that's already happening or uh could happen i think there's there's just going to be a, a need for a lot of sort of long-term dedicated work around community organizing uh sort of new participatory and democratic processes that yeah that allow us to embody these principles of a just transition right from the production of food through like distribution and consumption and also dealing with the kind of waste side of things as well and i think yeah i just think food's a food's a great way to sort of engage people anyway and bring people together like we all have to eat and i think with with the covid situation the the issue of kind of where our food comes from and who produces it and things like that is very much in people's minds so i think yeah now is really a good time to to make the most of this and kind of start taking more of these steps through the principles of a just transition to make the world that we want to see in terms of, of, of a more just food system. So I think I'll stop there for now and hand over to Sinead. Yeah, thank you, Kim, for that. Um, I really liked a lot of points you made. I love the points around um, how making the rural appealing to people in cities, but doing it in a way that doesn't necessarily harm those communities that are already there. I really like that point how like the food is like a way in, but actually there's a big conversation about the different ways that urban and rural needs to be connected. Um, and I like also that um, the, the point around um, the solidarity point, like the people that are feeding the cities and actually like how can we make those relationships closer together and more vivid for, it, for them. And then also highlighting the opportunity we have in front of us that actually COVID has made people think more about where they're getting food from um, with food shortages, et cetera. And so, yeah, thank you for that contribution. That was great. Um, Sinead, when you're ready. Hi, hello. Um, so I'm Sinead, um, I'm one half of Portside Farm, which is um, a small four and a half acre patch of land down in Sussex. Um, and I guess I'm going to be coming from the perspective of someone who started their growing journey and life in an urban environment. I'm born and bred East London, and I now live in the countryside in what sometimes feels like the middle of nowhere um and i've only been able to do that through a group called the ecological land co-op and their i guess rent to buy scheme and a kind of an unofficial um mortgage um otherwise this kind of transition isn't really something that would have been possible for someone like me when you kind of consider my class where i'm from the lack of wealth and security that i come from and they're in kind of like lies the issue, the accessibility between the two places, between urban and rural, and how people kind of transition between those um, fluidly, safely, securely, um, in a way that's, you know, healing and nurturing. So kind of as I pondered on the question, um, kind of got harder and harder, and it got a bit bigger, and it got deeper, and I started going into a bit of a hole about it, because um, I realised I actually had a lot more questions then answers so I'm I'm sorry about that because I ain't coming here with a lot of answers I'm just coming with a lot of more questions to the debate but that's hopefully something that we can kind of all talk about in this next hour and kind of co-create some of those um hopefully solutions and just share experiences 
um, of how we build that just transition. Because we're, we're not just talking about physicality here of, you know, urban and rural and the imbalanced access between those two places, but we're, we're talking about how, how, how we make that system more coherent and more equitable. And um, it's really vast. It's a, it's a divide that is really, really huge and spans so many different facets. It's, it's cultural, it's political, it's wealth, it's generational, age, it's racial, it's security-based, it's accessibility-based, it's class, it's transport, it's the movement between these places. And a lot of this is really entrenched in deep, deep history that goes really far back, far back from, you know, our generations. Some of this stuff and some of the issues between the urban environments and rural environments and the kind of deep assumptions each camp has goes back hundreds of years. So we've got a lot of dismantling to try and do. Um, and this is even more heightened when we think about the kind of polarized worlds that we now live in, where the divide, whatever the context is, has people sitting at one end and the other end. And there's very little scope for people to kind of come together. There's very little opportunity for people to come together. And that polarization just kind of festers more and more and more, especially in our kind of social media driven world where we a lot of us live in our own echo chambers so that kind of polarization ends up festering and brewing um so you know where on earth are the opportunities for rural and um urban communities to come together and this is i guess i'm coming at it from maybe like a ideological and anthropological point of view um and how do we do this reconciliation in a way that's based in justice, it's equitable, it's compassionate, it's healing, it's nurturing. And you have to start thinking about what's the commonality when we're thinking about healing, nurturing, compassion, where, where do we get those feelings from? And for me, the answer is, is nature, it's, um, and it's food. Um, there's nothing like food that can like bring people together. And the same for nature, nature, a lot of us all, go out into the great outdoors to kind of restore ourselves to connect to something that's kind of greater and deeper than the, I guess the world that we kind of engage with um and so I kind of think about what my experience was two years ago when I moved from East London um growing on a community garden um you know had a great support network of people had access to lots of different community growing spaces and um, because of just the sheer density of people in that space to then going to essentially the middle of nowhere with no one and no connections and everyone's so sparse and it's a very different place to where I'm from um and I, I came there with a really you know deep sense of like I don't belong here I feel really out of place I was worried about I was worried about not being accepted I was worried I was too different because you know, no one really looks like me, no one sounds like me. A lot of people in the area that I now live in don't have a lot of shared experiences. You know, we come from very different backgrounds and how, when we live in a world that is, you know, quite polarized, like how am I supposed to connect with these people? How am I supposed to feel comfortable and feel like I'm at home in this place? Um, and I kind of, I reflect on like, I'll go back even further, you know, how, what, what was my journey into like food and nature as a whole and I was very fortunate that although you know I lived on floor number 17 in the flats when I was younger I spent a lot of time in places like Epping Forest so that's like 20 minutes on the central line from East London um I spent a lot of time in places like Wanstead Flats and as a kid that was really really formative for me that early experience of being able to freely explore to freely roam to freely play to really find joy in nature helped me build that notion that I do belong in natural environments or in rural spaces that although there are these anthropological divides physically I belong in this space physically I'm as connected to these trees or the ground that's beneath my feet as as any other person and and I think 
I, I was very fortunate to have been taught from a very early age that like this land is my land. It's all of our land. And I think, so I'm kind of like rambling quite a lot here. Um, but I think the earlier we can kind of try and teach people that or young people that, that they are allowed to be in spaces that they want to be and they can claim spaces and they can feel comfortable in those spaces is really important. And one of the things that we're trying to do at all sides, you know, we're, we're small, but we've planted an acre and a half of woodland. We've made like, we're digging huge ponds to create like little water features that can hopefully you can like dip into them. We're working on a micro meadow where we've just kind of started finishing um, the building of our community growing space so we can grow food together. We've put in a community fruit orchard, we've set up wildlife watching spot, spots, we're creating an outdoor cooking space and all those joyful early experiences that I had that gave me a deep sense of belonging on the land and in the places that I go to regardless of what the world tells me if the world tells me I don't belong there that I was fortunate enough to be taught that I do belong we're trying to create that at all side we're trying to create a small pocket in the countryside that is a safe space for people to come and to start breaking down some of those fears of not belonging on the land because we all we all do belong and to bring people together around that commonality you know, you take all of our differences away, there are things that we all share, and that's, you know, food, it's the eating of food, a lot of us share that, um, and that kind of sense of healing and restoration from nature, and if we can bring people around that, that can be a really powerful means of starting to break down that disconnect between the ideologies and the assumptions and the stereotypes that each camp from rural and urban kind of has. Um, between each other that's what we're hoping anyway um we'll see if it works in practice but in our kind of like first year of kind of piloting it some of it you know we've been able to bring together like groups of people so far that you know wouldn't necessarily get together that often and you know we've been able to share the joy of growing a plant together and then later on in the day we'll go and eat that plant and yeah that's something that's really um I guess, yeah, hopefully like powerful in starting to break down and build more of a connection between those two spaces. Anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. Otherwise I'll, I'll ramble forever. Thanks, Sinead. That, I'm just like, I'm just trying to like process it because it was so useful in its, how comprehensive it was. Like talking about kind of the more macro stuff and the components we're talking about, like the elements, like how do we transport the, transport the food? How do we consume it? How do we like, deal with wastage how do we do all that stuff how, um but also the context it sits within like the levels of inequality etc and then also like the cu cultural side of it of like the divides that are in society that make some of these movements or the progress that we want to see difficult um and then also bringing your kind of personal journey and personal experience and contention like taking us on a journey with that it was very very rich so thank you um thank you yeah, it was really, really great. The So we're going to move into like the questions that I have for you based on your remarks. Um, and I want to start with you, Sinead, if that's OK. Um, so as you were speaking, you kind of spoke about how when you moved to a more rural area, there were these kind of a lot of challenges that you had um, feeling kind of out of place and things like that. And um, as you were speaking, I was kind of like the first place I went to was like, um, like what was the moment that you that you that like shifted for you that was like I want to do this thing, I want to move, I want to like cultivate this this relationship. But then actually, as you were speaking, because actually it sounds like you cultivated that want over a long period of time. So actually, the question I want to ask is more to do with for people people of color and people that have been like othered, hardcore othered in like especially rural spaces. What did you do? to resource yourself in, in like what do you do to resource yourself in the context of like being feeling quite othered um I know that you, you mentioned in when you were talking that actually your connection to nature helped a lot with that um but wondering how actually you deal with the like what you say is like the anthropological side of it like the people element and the, the polarization like what how do you resource yourself and kind of speaking to people that might be in your position a bit like behind you in your journey of that yeah I am 
I yeah, this is a bit of a hard one. I don't, I, I don't necessarily know. I think I think a lot of it does stem from that, um, from like being really young and being taught that like I. I, I can be wherever I want and I and to like find like a deep comfort of like who I am which like I, I've struggled a lot like I'm not I don't come at it as at this as just like oh well, you know I just I feel good to be me like it, it was a long reckoning to like feel comfortable in my skin to feel comfortable being a woman to, and being a woman of color like I I went through a lot of um I guess a, a big journey to feel comfortable with those feelings but a lot of it was through just being out in in nature I guess um so like when I first started growing I started growing in um in East London and and I think just that deep connection of just seeing seeing different forms of wildlife seeing different plants and just appreciating the sheer diversity and the beauty of the natural world and just realizing or like find, finding some empowerment of that of just like like I spend a lot of time just like observing things that like I could sit by a flower and just like watch what's going on and I think some mm. of that of just observing what's going on in the other world the natural world just kind of made me feel quite grounded of mm. this this thing is just like this ladybird's just doing its business and it's you know it's interacting and there's like a spider over here and the two of those are just they're just getting on and having a nice time and I know it sounds like so it just sounds so basic and like not really that I, I don't know what it, it, what it is deep for me I guess but it was just yeah just observing the natural world and just like mm -hmm. as I observed and as I spent more time in it through growing I started to feel really connected to it. Like I, I feel very like spiritually connected to like I guess the natural world now. Um mm. and I think through that it's just it's just opened up like a whole new perspective of just like we're we're all part of this thing. We're all part of this natural world. And I think that's kind of helped me feel grounded that if you know if someone I've I've had my interaction like since moving here of you know someone they'll talk to Adam like my other half he's you know he's a white man they'll talk to him but they don't talk to me and that used to make me feel a certain way but I think because I feel so empowered from the natural world and just the work that I'm doing and that my sense of self that don't bother me like that mm. that's that's that person's problem mm. it's not my problem it's it's that like not holding on to that problem like I'm not the problem here I think this is something that Josina and Dee said like in a talk early last year which really helped transform my thinking I'm not the problem they're the problem mm -hmm. so if someone's intimidated by me that's not my problem that's their problem mm -hmm. and and I think starting to dismantle that so it's a re really like long-winded answer but yeah it was some of that kind of it's not me it's them I haven't got to fix that yeah, I just yeah. need to look after this yeah um thank you for sharing that I think in 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 that contribution is like the, what I'm feeling within me is like a tension between um, the complexities of the world that we deal with and the simplicity of like when you observe a spider and a butterfly just like hanging out um, and like that, that tension, but also the beauty in that. And also the, what I appreciate and what you're saying is like the nuance of your journey, because actually like when we're talking about the connection between the urban and the rural, we are talking about people in a lot in a lot of ways actually so having like a a nuanced understanding of that journey is really important and actually in what what i'm hearing what you're saying as well is the strength that you find is actually your your anchor and your relationship to nature and actually every time you're feeling a bit overwhelmed you come back to that relationship to feel like quite grounded um thank you for that Sinead. you said it so much more succinctly than i did thank you I mean, you, you <laughs> said it i'm just summarizing i'm doing the easy bit i'm doing the easy bit um thank you so much for that i really appreciate it um kim how you doing kim um so the question that i had for you um off the back of what you said is you mentioned um and i appreciate this might be a bit quick big question but you mentioned just transition a few times um, in what you said, and I'm wondering for you, what are the characteristics of a just transition within the context of food? 
that is a big question um thanks um <laughs> i'll try my best i think hmm, i mean i think quite a lot of the sort of you know the 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 principles of the just transition and for me i you know i kind of draw on the, on the work of people like um the climate justice movement and that sort of um indigenous informed uh principles of just transition so yeah about thinking about things like redistribution of resources um kind of ecological economies and regenerative economies meaningful work um culture and traditions um I have missed a whole bunch, but there's a whole load of them. And I think all of them kind of relate to, to food in their own ways. And I think a lot of them um, uh, come through the food sovereignty movement quite strongly already about in terms of, you know, food sovereignty, having those principles of people having control over every part of the food system, whether it's production or consumption or uh, distribution, everything. And, and for that to be the kind of basis of the food system that we want. Um, so I, I think there's a, yeah, there's obviously a strong uh, need for kind of the cultures and traditions of food to, to come back in a lot more. I think that's something that's really removed at the minute. And obviously, uh, you know, I have a lot to learn from other, other cultures, other traditions, people of color in terms of their, um, their heritages of, of food and and i yeah went to an amazing talk yesterday on kind of culturally appropriate food not just as about the the actual food itself but the methods and the histories and how all of that is so important so i think there's a there's a lot to do there and kind of bringing back that storytelling and the the relationships to to food and not just seeing it as a product um i think the 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 piece around kind of redistribution of farm resources is absolutely key like from from land to uh the kind of capital you need to set up uh different you know parts of farming or food uh distribution and consumption um uh what else i'm rambling already um, it's a big question i think there's yeah there's work to do on kind of every one of those principles in in bringing them into the food system but i think yeah like, i mean so much of what shania talked about that that connection to the natural world and food as such a place of bringing people together a good way to bring together is just such a it's a good way to lead into some of those broader principles of just transition mm -hmm. thank you for that so <clears throat> it does connect basically to um the next question i wanted to ask you both actually um in that this topic is very broad um, you know, we have big concepts like connecting the rural to the urban and like a just transition and those things are huge. And within the food system, there's obviously lots of different things to consider. You have like consumption, distribution and trading, production waste. And so, um, and then within the, like, you know, the just transition element of it, you have like racial justice, equity, redistribution of wealth, pulling down power down into communities. Um, and I guess one of the one of the beautiful things about a just transition is um, is that the the what we're trying to do in the process of getting to like a new economy and a new food system that we want to see is that is being formulated and vision and being thought about by the people that it's most going to impact. And so actually, it's difficult. I, I appreciate that it's difficult to character like to paint a picture of what it is. Um, but, however comma um if like um what areas are you both um i'm going to pose it to both of you like particularly drawn to um and what issues do you think we should play play pay close attention to is it kind of like i mean i and this isn't there's no hierarchy um of like issues but is it kind of like you know the su uh, supply chain is it kind of the workers rights for farmers is it kind of like the migration question in the workforce and what what um what are things should we be particularly is it like land ownership what things should we be drawn to or paying close attention to from your perspective when we think about connecting the rural to the urban in terms of food system um yeah Sinead, go for it thank you um, I'd say probably like the biggest, most fundamental issue is, is land, is access to land. Um, and or, or at least like for me, I, I see it as one of the big issues is just 
that's that's the kind of first starting point and and the kind of disparity of like in in urban environments and in um cities like the growing space that's there is actually far more diverse far more um ecologically good um can't find a better word than good than a lot of like rural spaces even though like rural takes up a huge 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 amount of space but actually like contributes to like a huge like disproportionate amount of destruction based on like kind of its space compared to like an urban environment um or, and their growing spaces um so i think like that kind of does disparity or, or land use i guess that's that's probably like the better um word rather than just like access to land it's like the use of land um mm. and how and how yeah that's um the kind of like disproportionate uses of land in different spaces and how one area can be more destructive than the other and kind of yeah reconciling that I think is really important because um you know so much land is or I guess there's so much land kind of held up in rural spaces but that has such a disproportionate effect on um things like water the environment like different environmental factors um and a lot of like the healing work that needs to be done for our environment needs to be done in that kind of bigger space which is I guess yeah the kind of rural space so yeah I think that's that's for me is kind of where like a lot of the issues lie but also where a lot of the opportunities and solutions for improving things lie. Okay so kind of this um, land use and like urban and rural land use serving different purposes um and um and what you said something about you said um one can be more destructive destructive than others uh, like can you like as can you clarify that a bit can you say more about, about that yeah i guess in the sense of um i i mean more kind of i guess in like wild, wildlife for instance and like kind of wildlife losses that actually urban environment are much more rich in terms of um that say you've got tons and tons of people's different gardens you've got lots of different community gardens all growing different things that actually creates that quite a like rich diverse um ecological space in the like to some degree um obviously you've got a lot of like things like concrete etc that you know wildlife doesn't really engage with but when you look at like say the same footprint of like wildlife like take our field that we're on our like our four acres is part of a 20 acre field the ecological study for that was it was basically completely barren it didn't support any life and um had huge effects on like the local water um because of like the over fertilization of the field that huge field that 20 acres is supporting very very little apart from like a lot of destruction whereas say if you took 20 acres in an urban environment there's actually probably a lot more good that can be going on in terms of like all of the different plants that are being grown um so I'm talking about it like purely from like an ecological perspective when I talk about the like destruction mm -hmm. um imbalance uh, that often people look I think maybe a better way to put it is often people look at the countryside and say oh what a beautiful place it's so like this like huge landscapes are really really great but actually what you're looking at when you look at rolling fields is destruction that's active destruction it doesn't support very much life um mm -hmm. and i think it's yeah maybe twisting the way that we look at kind of rural spaces as you know beautiful rolling hills is actually like that's really not very good um for wildlife it's probably a, a little like slightly better more succinct way of describing what i was trying to say mm. Thank you for, I'm so happy I asked you that follow-up question because that is so interesting to me of being like, of flipping that on its head, like that that narrative of rural is beautiful, urban is kind of like not the one in terms of nature, but actually like, um, and also I think, you know, a lot of people in urban environments can learn so much from people in rural environments about nature, but actually that kind of flips it on the head in some mm -hmm. way. Absolutely. Actually, yeah. um, thank you so much for that. That was actually great I'm, I'm like want to ask some questions about that but we'll go to um kim for the same question thanks yes it's hard to follow that <laughs> but it does it, it brings to mind a lot of kind of similar points because i think i was going to say as well access to land is just the most fundamental thing to 
in my opinion, because it opens up all the other spaces, like the spaces where people can connect. And, and I think sort of, I was going to say getting over, but that's not the right term that I want to use. I mean, moving to a situation where we don't feel this sense of scarcity, which has been kind of put upon us by the fact that like these massive estates and the tiny concentration of people that own most of the land and, and have access to it makes you know most of the rest of us feel like we that we we don't have these spaces that we can go into and be free and um access you know without fear and things like that um and so i think the more that we can reform the land system break up those estates and things like that so that people have that space then the more other things can follow um the you know these spaces for kind of healing and connection will just be much more widespread whether that's with each other or you know other other living beings and landscapes um and yeah i think i feel like i had another point but i think maybe she put it better anyway so yeah i'll go with that for now <laughs> okay um you said a, I kind of want to hear this other point that you that you've not said, um, but we'll maybe you'll come back to it. Um, and you said breaking up, like okay, no, yeah, scarcity, mm -hmm. Lands, like people that there being a sense of. I mean, is there? Can you expand on that at all? Like people feeling a sense of like, is it a sense of like there not being enough land? Like people feeling that way in like is that and is there a difference between like maybe a rural and urban sense of that or? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that I think the rural and the urban are connected a bit because I I don't know I mean it's it obviously plays into a kind of right wing like fascist narrative that we're like a crowded country so we've got no space for more people and you know it, it feeds into all of that but I think this whole like it's an inventive narrative like there is there is enough space and the reason why we feel like there's not enough space is because most of it isn't accessible to most people so I think. Um, I think, yeah, that kind of there's a there's a bit of a sort of um, mental narrative shift. And I think, yeah, anyone who has had heard about any of the work that like uh, the, the Future Narratives Lab and us and loads of other people did on the kind of narratives work around land. What we talked a lot about that idea of like, um, you know, one of the dominant narratives presented to us is that we're like a, you know, a crowded country and land and resources are scarce. But actually, you know, that's not necessarily the case and we can or it is only the case because the land system, the way it is at the minute is in incredibly concentrated in its ownership and access. So I think there's kind of a, there's sort of a mental uh, transition to make in terms of kind of seeing through those sorts of narratives that are like pushed upon us a lot of the time. And then, uh, and then there's the actual physical reality of like, well, okay, even if we think, yeah, actually that's nonsense, you know, there's still work to be done to actually get access to the land. Um, you know, even if even if we think it's actually not scarce, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I want to bring so so both of you named land access to land, land scarcity, kind of the kind of the ways that we use land. Um, and you know, Sinead talked about the connection between the rural and the urban in terms of, I guess, what one can learn from the other, kind of that kind of more softer relationship. But I'm, I suppose in the context of access to land and that relationship between the urban and the rural, what comes to mind um, in, term, in, in terms of that specifically? You know, like um, land scarcity, access to land, what land is used for? And, that, and bearing in mind that we're, we're talking about cultivating that connection between urban and rural. I, there's not a right answer. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I just, I'm saying it, hoping that it maybe provokes something. And that's for both people. That's either anyone that wants to jump in. Sorry. Um, go ahead, Sinead, go ahead. No, um, I, you cut out a little bit for me during that. Do you mind like typing it? Um, maybe whilst like Kim answers, sorry. Yeah, I can I can start while Kennedy types. Um, I think it maybe it's worth me expanding a little bit on this the stuff I said in this sort of opening remarks about um, you know, kind of like what what people's impressions of what the countryside is for, which I think are maybe well, yeah, they're they're quite different, I think, to what people think maybe urban landscapes are for. And 
And yeah, in the in the Land Recent Empire keynote speech yesterday with Josina and Sam and Corin, um, I think Corin spoke about there's this long history of, of rural areas being like a place of retreat. And I was like, mm, yeah, <laughs> like, and I think you can just see that completely continuing as people in in urban areas think, well, yeah, that's the kind of place I can go for a holiday. Um, well, some people in urban areas anyway, who have that kind of class and racial privilege and things like that. Um, and there's less thought about it as like a working landscape or as like a space for like the creation of culture or community and things like that. And I think it's interesting because I think basically if you ask like somebody from a rural community versus somebody who lives in a city, yes, thank you, Jacina, the rural idol, that's what I was trying to say. Um, uh, their kind of perceptions of what both of those landscapes are for, they probably have totally different answers and different people in those areas probably have totally different answers. So, but I think, I think there's there's probably some some work to be done to have kind of both of those different sets of people see both landscapes as having a whole range of possibilities and not such a limited possibility. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kim. So the idea, like what I heard in what you're saying is um, there's quite uh, a fixed perception of people that live in urban areas of what the utility is of rural areas is. And so that, in that and that is like, there's like a knock on effect of like all the different consequences that has. And that is um, quite an, and the sense what I got from what you're saying as well is that that's quite um, an established historical thing, actually, like what the way that rural areas are perceived and used um, by specifically by people that live in urban areas. And so there's work to do with that relationship, not necessarily obviously how rural people perceive themselves, but how mm. people that live in urban areas perceive rural areas. Yeah, and I think just one one final thing that's just come to mind is that, you know, the, in terms of those histories, the fact that, you know, the, it was the process of enclosure and everything that brought so many more people off the rural areas into the cities and they've now like kind of lost that history and connection to what rural landscapes were to them and to their families and things like that like yeah that's just another part of the whole history and and why this there's sort of now this split in perceptions i think yeah i'm being compelled to bring in that i don't know why it just popped in my head that thing that you said in your opener kim where you're talking about like how has i'm like curious right of how that relationship has undermined solidarity between people that work in urban and rural areas of being like, you know, a worker in on a farm in a rural area versus kind of like someone that's consuming it in an urban area and like how they perceive each other. Um, it's interesting, a lot of what's coming up in this these conversations is kind of the culture relational kind of stuff between the people and the relationship to land and food. Um, that feels like a big piece. Um, before I get on to the next question, Sinead, did you want to add anything to that? I think really just to kind of like echo that I think it comes back to that kind of like the assumptions that each kind of space has on one another and how to use those spaces um and you know how do we start dismantling that and and I think a huge part of it is you know like framing the countryside and rural er areas as like not so much as just this like leisure space but actually like you know these can be like thriving living working spaces that we engage with and I guess that's something that like the ecological land co-op are trying to work on who we got our land from um is like trying to open up some more of that rural space but yeah and a lot of it goes like it's so it's so 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 entrenched it's um I I can't I don't know like Mark from um shared assets will know so much more about this but like that idea of like the common the commons and like when that was all kind of dismantled and people essentially like lost right to spaces that were once all of our spaces it is it's strange that we that we are now in this place where there is a divide when you know go back maybe like four or five hundred years ago there, there wasn't a divide it was there for everybody everybody could forage everybody grew everybody and slowly that was dismantled by people you know taking it and saying oh no people can't go there anymore i own that and it's that idea of ownership that like really just needs to be kind of I guess like flipped on its head and questioned but how you do that that is you know that is like a whole like that is a whole week of talks or year of talks yeah. um not like something you can kind of get into in like an hour and a half but it's yeah it's there's so much to be broken down mm, I like how do we talk about the rural and the urban in a way that doesn't reinforce the separation of them or 
yeah absolutely so, yeah um also i just want to if anyone like everyone that's watching like this there seems to be like quite a vibrant and great conversation happening in the chat as well so that's supplementing the conversation happening here i'm really enjoying so if you are draw your attention to that um and i'm seeing everyone's contribution i just can't read everyone's out um right now so um the before we get into kind of hearing from everyone else i did want to ask a question about kind of infrastructure or or examples of infrastructure that exist that embody or are close to embodying just transition principles that connect the rural and urban food system so what what relationships and infrastructure like like that you know of um kind of embodies connecting the urban and rural in in, in terms of the food system um and i will go who wants to take that first actually um i'll i'll, I'll go um, I, i'm not like fully like i i don't really know um i i think there's not i, I don't know if there's like a huge amount of like places or like schemes that i i know of personally i'm sure there's loads and loads um and maybe it's just a product of like where i live and i don't really like see a lot of it but i think like i think it comes into that kind of like um peri-urban environments and like kind of that those spaces i um i think Sutton community farm are quite like a nicely situated example of you know somewhere that's like urban so a lot of people from like the city can go and you know volunteer experience um I guess some of the things that we're talking about in a setting that's like not that's like that's big um I guess you know in, in a lot of um kind of urban growing you know spaces aren't really much bigger than like kind of I don't know like 500 square meters or something so to go somewhere that's like several acres like it's a whole new scale um so I think kind of more examples or like seeing more of that as kind of you know farms that are on like near cities but like accessible i think that's partly you know something that we struggle with is like the accessibility and you know this has come up quite a bit um of like rural environments kind of rely on you having a car to get around so one of the issues that we find is like getting people to the farm or getting people to us is actually like quite difficult um because if you don't drive you can't really get to us um so yeah it's that i think yeah, I don't see as much of it as like would be that I'd like to see, but I think a lot of it is a product of like an issue of like transportation and movement between the two. That's not very like fluid. Mm. Yeah, the image that was coming to my mind as you were speaking was the idea that you have kind of urban and you have the rural and actually like peri-urban can act as a space to smooth out the edges, to like blend those spaces together and make them more accessible to people that are in a city and in cities. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, was that? Um, did do you want to add anything, Kim? To that? Um, uh, yeah, I can add. I can add something. So I think I, I maybe just to focus on the sort of like distribution side, which might not be the, the I don't know the most interesting side, but no, just because it's where I can think of examples like quickly. I mean, I think in terms of. Um, there's there's some good things around like solidarity shares in terms of veg boxes. So uh, that's where you know if you have a sort of veg box scheme, there might be a higher price set for more affluent people to pay uh, to kind of subsidise that food being available for people who can't afford the the usual price. So I think that's kind of a way that um, you have that connection that you get through a kind of veg box and knowing who's grown it and the stories behind the food and things like that opens it up to a broader range of people hopefully you know in urban environments and another another way actually is kind of a bigger scale of that i guess would be thinking about kind of procurement and making procurement processes in urban areas more accessible to small scale farmers in in the peri-urban or the rural areas um and again you know that that being a way that some of that good fresh food can get into places like care homes and schools and hospitals and those kind of conversations can start to happen even in in those sort of spaces that yeah for people who might not be able to to get out personally to see the farm or anything but at least they feel like they have a bit more of that connection with the people growing their food in rural areas and things like that um and finally i think uh i just think this idea of like spaces where people could come together like bearing in mind everything she just said about transport i think yeah there just needs to be like a public transport revolution basically but 
I know places like uh, the National Food Service are doing work around kind of community kitchens and spaces where people can kind of come together and eat. And I wonder what how that would be possible in a more sort of rural setting, but to make it more more accessible. And maybe it is in those in those peri-urban areas where that is like more more feasible at the minute anyway. So there was like the the veg box schemes as a way to get kind of um, food that's grown in rural areas straight to people's doorsteps in, in urban areas and like people starting to, and that as a way to start for people to start thinking about where they're getting their food from and feeling closer to the food that has grown and things like that and then also that point that you made about procurement processes like in different institutions in urban areas and like where they are purchasing their food and what and like local food growers etc um and then there was a point about uh public transport and people coming together so how can um different spaces like uh, the National Food Service, um, as an example of that, are bringing people together to, um, well, it sounds like there's like a, a double thing there, bringing people together to kind of build a relationship to their food, but also kind of build a relationship with each other, which sounds corny, but is a thing. Um, and then how can that be replicated in more rural areas as well? Um, cool, thank you for that. Okay. Sinead and Kim, you can breathe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and calm and exhale. Um, what we're gonna do now, um, there's been a lot, there's a lot has been said um, and a lot has not been said that could be said, should be said, right? Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put everybody into, apart from the speakers, into um, groups of three and four to discuss a bit about what they've heard. And we're gonna come back together to kind of discuss any of the questions and things that have come up. We won't be able to get to everything, um, but I just notice what you've been drawn to, notice what's like giving you kind of that kind of burning sensation of like, I need to talk about this um, and bring it to that space. And hopefully we can get to it, but if we can't, you know, do more reading around it, do more research. Um, and yeah, so if people are okay, we'll go into groups of three and four and just discuss what you've heard. What, what was like, you heard that, that um, surprised you or you're curious about. And then we'll discuss that when we come back. And we're gonna do that for five minutes. Five them, yeah, five minutes. So we have enough time to discuss it. Welcome back, welcome back. I hope you had a good time in your breakout. Um, okay, so um, well, I've got a, okay, cool. So how, how I'm thinking this is gonna be done is, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Zoom, but if you look at the bottom bar, you'll see rea reactions with a little smiley face. If you click on that, you can raise your hand. Um, and that'll indicate to me that you raise your hand. Um, and then I can pick you. And I think what we'll do is we'll take like three contributions um, and then we'll go back to the speakers and we'll do it like that. And we'll have a discussion maybe around those. So, if you've got something like a burning sensation, something to share, feeling inspired, um, or just actually, actually, I'm maybe making the bar way too high. Um, anything will do. <laughs> uh, cool, we've got Emily. And maybe other people will raise their hands as we go on. So Emily, do you wanna go for it? Emily O'Brien. Thanks. Um, it, we didn't really kind of talk about it in the breakout room, but I've just decided to put in the chat as well. Just um, I work um, supporting food partnerships around the country, you know, although I've been involved in kind of um, lots of stuff to do with food partnerships. I used to work for Brighton Hove Food Partnership, but currently I'm particularly supporting rural food partnerships. And just to say, I think with everything, with all the stuff that's changing at the minute and the growing movement around food partnerships, I'm just just sort of putting out a plug, I suppose, for the role that they can play um, in bringing you know rural and urban together and also helping to put some of those people in the room or in the virtual room who can help to make some of those connections um, and I sort of slightly brought that up as well because I was really delighted to see that actually there's a bit of a connection between Allside Farm and you know the amazing stuff that we've heard um, which was absolutely brilliant thank you for that um, and Eastbourne Food Partnership um, I live you know in between Brighton and Eastbourne so they're my near neighbours so that's that's brilliant to hear thanks um Emily sorry yeah um, 
Can you just quickly briefly say like what the characteristics of a like Brighton Health Food and Food Partnership are for people that aren't familiar with these food partnerships? Yeah, so food partnerships are a growing movement around the country. It's about 75 altogether now. And it's about the idea of taking a whole food system approach. So um, it, it basically, you know, food tends to sit with sort of agriculture over here and then nutrition and public health, a whole different narrative over there. Um, and then you've got people doing amazing stuff on the ground. You've got food poverty. And it's about taking a sort of system wide approach um, by by saying you can't actually you know, one one organisation can't really just look at those things in isolation. So you need to put people together to do that from across the food system. Um, mm. It started out as very much an urban thing. I think it particularly suited that sort of city set up and where there's just one council, you know, like a unit tree or a city type council where all those kind of different council functions all sit together and they tend to be a bit more coherent. But it's increasingly spread into rural areas. And I started work about a month ago for Food Matters, um, who are part of the Sustainable Food Places kind of support stuff. Um, and particularly looking at um, supporting rural food partnerships and there's some brilliant stuff around supply chains and things going on. Some of the procurement stuff that Kim mentioned, so food partnerships are quite involved in helping some of that to happen because it is about, you know, looking down the food system, not seeing the urban as completely separate from where the food comes from. Um, so I was just putting in a bit of a plug for that. Um, if people are interested in food partnerships, if they Google sustainable food places, there's a whole list of the ones who are members all around the country. It's about 60 are members, although there's a few who are just sort of on that journey to becoming members or doing their own yeah. thing. Um, so, so, yes, I'll, I'll put in a link in the chat. It's maybe easiest. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Um, Rachel. Thanks. Um, I want to offer a quick bit of appreciation and, and then a, a suggestion and a question, and I'll try and be really succinct. Um, I think this has just been such a fabulous session. It's been my favourite session of the conference so far. Um, I just think what you did so well was you linked some um, really personal stories of people's um, sort of own sort of deep questions and, and experiences and transformation to um, the biggest issues, you know, that, in, that enfold the whole of the, the food system and the future of, um, you know, all of us um, on, on the planet um, through this, this issue of, of the urban and the rural and the links. So, and I think that really was helped by your amazing chairing um, and, um, and by having just a couple of speakers and really going backwards and forwards for, for a long time and iterating and, and digging deeper into the issues. So that was amazing. And this links to my suggestion or, or provocation maybe, which is that I think something that's really important that's maybe not coming to the surface in a lot of the talks here today is about storytelling and how we tell um, really good, inspiring stories um, about um, the things that we're doing. Um, about our mission and you know there's a lot of discussions that are very practical um, and that's really important and helpful um, but sort of often further sort of divide up the um, the sort of overarching narratives and I think that we sometimes miss the bigger narrative um, so I would I would like to sort of suggest um, you know people to reflect on on how we're doing that storytelling and so then my question because I've been thinking about this a lot and how I can try and do that is about how we use um media but you know old new whatever sort of forms of media to tell our stories um from you know of reconnecting with the land of um connecting urban and, urban and rural food systems um, and you know I've started to dibble and dabble with social media and it's very new for me but I'd love to hear more about um, how people are, are sort of getting their stories out and the impact that that's having. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you for all of your kind words. Um, I'll pay you later. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh, cool. Since we haven't got any more hands, we'll go back to the, oh, well, we'll take Simon's and then we'll go to the speakers. Go for it, Simon. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to 100% agree with, Rock Rachel said this has been a really quite amazing session and, and the point on urban beauty and rural degradation is is, is superb. Um, but I, I think that there's there's three there's three things is that uh, speaking from quite a lot of personal experience, um, having kind of the stuff that we want to push happen um, 
in specific places at a, a local level is really important because that changes the local level. But the, the point on storytelling and imagination is really important, basically. The more, the more we have, um, and it's something that Rob Hopkins writes a lot about, but the more that we can show examples of what a positive future looks like, um, the, the better it is. Uh, and, and showing those stories of what, what's possible at a local level is really important in changing the narrative. Um, and then on top of that, the third point is, is about the, the heavy lifting of systemic change through policy and legislation. Mm -hmm. But my view is, and, and, and I always come back to what Malcolm X said, by any means necessary, and, and I take that notion to mean that we need all these different levels of operation, um, but without the local level action and without the imagination and the storytelling and without the heavy lifting of policy and legislate, legis, 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 I can't speak today. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> then I think that's, that's where it's needed on all three levels. Um, and the, the more links that can be made between those of us that are writing about policy and law and those of us who are working on a local level and those of us who want to tell those stories, then the better. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Simon. So that was a very rich round of contributions. I thank you so much for that. And I'm going to try and summarise them. Um, so we started by talking about um, food partnerships. Nice plug, by the way. Um, but the, I think the that kind of what was underneath it, what I kind of took away from it was the idea that there's like a there are people coming together that are that are working in different parts of the food system in a locality to kind of think about the food system um, at different levels of change. That kind of links very nicely to what you were saying, Simon, just now. Um, then we moved into kind of this question around storytelling. Um, storytelling and the power of storytelling, not only for like our individual journeys, but also kind of like the narratives that are out there in society already that may be working for and against us in having the world that we want to see something that's been quite pre prevalent in this session has been like the more like perception cultural side of things shifting people's relationships to land and their localities um and something that i think is really important which simon said was kind of like what's going on in the local like hyper local where what are the examples that we're seeing how can we like see it to believe it kind of thing but also how can we imagine um and and how can we do that through storytelling and like make maybe um, having these example, hyper-local examples, but using it as inspiration for other areas. And which I think is really important is that systemic change piece. So like the idea of that actually to achieve systemic change, we do need people working at different levels of change and in different, using different tactics as well to achieve it. So lots there, we've got 15 minutes left of the session, um, but I'm gonna bring it back to Sinead and Kim to see if they've got any reflections or if that's provoked anything, I'm sure it has for you. I, I just want to come in quickly on the storytelling point before it fades from my mind. Um, I think the point actually about um, storytelling and those creating those spaces of like joy and imagination and reflection is so crucial to being able to work at all the levels that we need to work at, like Simon just said. Like I think, and and I and food is just such a powerful way to do that. It links so much to memory and you know our our families, our histories, no matter where we come from. And I think. Yeah, the more spaces we can create to have those sort of real, physical, like embodied experiences and share our stories with each other can just bring people from the same backgrounds together, but also, you know, bring people from different backgrounds together and help under understand each other more. So, yeah, I think it's storytelling is part of the work, but it's also like really um, like enlivening for the rest of the work. Mm. So storytelling as a way of like doing the messaging and things like that, but also actually quite reinvigorating, nourishing. Yeah. Anything else on any other conversation? Sinead? Yeah, I think I think I definitely agree about the storytelling. I think that's kind of like on a good day when I'm like friends with social media, like that's that's the beauty of things like social media is that like we can, can we can put out into the world like our own like narrative, our own story and kind of you know put out there what we're doing to hopefully encourage others to do it um and to like you know 
I guess create like a space that like we can kind of yeah all learn from one another um so yeah I, I think that's something that's really like great about kind of yeah the access to platforms that we have today um mm -hmm. to be able to like tell that story from your perspective um and I think I think that's also really important like you telling the story I think what we found a lot and like I, I've I've found of you know sometimes working with media we've had a lot of like kind of people maybe fixate on like the wrong things about our story and what we're trying to like get out there and yeah I think it's really like yeah things like social media are great for like yeah you being able to put your voice out there and like what you're doing um without that being like misconstrued or the wrong thing being focused on um so yeah I, I think that's a really like a powerful thing because it, it you know it helps inspire other people learn from other people and just creating that like sense of community I think that's one of the things that actually really helped with this kind of transition especially moving to the countryside during a pandemic so we couldn't really meet a lot of people we were kind of on our own like we really built up like a sense of like community and solidarity like online through like people all over the country either going through similar things or just like the general support of people so yeah I think the kind of like storytelling it's like it can go really far um which is yeah really important thanks and that piece about um change happening at different levels kind of brought in a Malcolm X quote we'd love to see it is there anything that people like Sinead and um, Kim is there anything you want to say on that piece and I think that also connects to maybe the food partnership piece as well and it's okay down it's a good question <laughs> um yeah I mean I I think um I would like for me change um like I used to work in food policy I got quite frustrated in food policy um and but that's just you know personally for me change I see it as like a grassroots community thing. I see it like a bottom up approach that, you know, if you bring enough people together and we collectively are asking for something and we're collectively working towards something is better than and more powerful to me than like a top down approach, which like I get quite frustrated with like the bureaucracy of, of like working in that space. But that's just like personally me, there are people that I give all of my like admiration to that can like work in that space um and that's that's the beauty of like this space is just you know we all have different things to like contribute like I can contribute this in like this method so like my like a bottom-up approach but then there's someone else that can you know do that top down approach and if we can like bring all of those people together that makes it so much more coherent um and more powerful um so yeah I think like under understanding each other's um strengths is a really good thing and also just putting your hands up and like saying I'm not good at this thing so like it's better if someone else does it and I think that's something that we're really trying to like or like I've been personally trying to do a lot more is that um there's I can't remember the name of it at the moment but there's this um there's basically like this wheel and it's like it tells you about the different forms of activism and sometimes we can often feel like we have to do everything you know we have to be like the big vocal voice we have to be the the nurturer the caregiver and actually it's absolutely fine to just be one of those elements of like one of the like 12 different types of like activism and then but like partnering up with like people in that can do all of those other things if like, if the thing comes to my head I'll try and find the link to and um, this diagram but it's really really good at like reframing like change and how to collectively come together to make change work I don't know about that wheel but I know a wheel um that has like um like they're usually like within a movement of three different pieces of the pie there's the individual action no in um there is challenging dominant institutions which is usually, usually the policy piece there's building alternatives, which is kind of like what you see about co-ops and things like that, like small scale alternative models. And then you've got the personal empowerment, which is kind of like building knowledge and confidence and things like that. And what's happened in this conversation is that we spoke, spoke about all three of those and kind of going back to that contribution that was talking about change at different levels. Those three pieces have to be in conversation with each other and work with the work alongside each other. But obviously there's tensions around that theories of change are different usually within those spaces so we've got eight minutes left I see your hand Rachel um it uh, was there anybody else that wanted to ask um a question that hasn't asked a question yet before we move to closing 
Okay, that's fine. So uh, Rachel, go for it. Sorry, I did lower my hand because I think you just made the point that I was going to make actually, Kennedy. I um, I did um, my PhD about 12 years ago um, about um, how different levels of um, civil society or, or groups working at different levels of civil society um, can work um, to, to, to drive systemic change um, and, and you know, uncovered some amazing stories about how some really significant changes had come about. Um, things like the, the, the food partnerships movement and the big changes in food procurement that um, happened um, in this country and um, changes around animal welfare that all came about because um, people that were working at the grassroots, people that were working in movement building, um, people who were working at policy change and systemic levels and, and also those doing the sort of storytelling. Um, my model had sort of four four pieces rather than three, were actually coming together and, and working together and sort of um, harnessing sort of moments of change in the wider um, context and the, the wider landscape to sort of really push on an issue at a particular time. And so then I fed that into how um, funders um, can be better supporting, um, you know, system change um, in food and agriculture by looking at, at, at funding at all of these different levels um, and, and also trying to support groups to work together strategically on different issues. But actually the point I just wanted to make was it's all about connection. And although, you know, these, these models, you can have a model with three points or a model with four points or whatever. Um, I think the, the real point is um, that, that like the wider sort of natural world around us, um, that, that we are an ecology or an ecosystem and more connections and more diversity is better. So, um, you know, we all need to retreat and we all need to sometimes go inwards, um, particularly at this sort of dark um, time of year. But we do also need to push ourselves to connect more. So um, perhaps that feels like sort of finishing on a bit of a, an, a possibly an empty platitude, but I hope it's not. I hope um, that there was something a bit more in that. And thank you. No, thank you. I, I mean, the big one you said was like, follow the money. <laughs> Where's, the, <who's laughs> well, yeah. Where's the money going? Um, who's, how are the funders supporting what things? How are they connecting those different groups that they're supporting? Um, and I really like the idea of being like, there's lots of models around change making, what that looks like. But ultimately, what what's underneath what we're saying is this idea of an ecosystem or an ecology of change making and that we kind of need each other to feed on that, no matter what your profession or where you sit within the movement. Um, Okay, cool. So we've got five minutes left. Um, I want to go back to Kim and Sinead. If there's like anything finally you want to say just quickly um, before we wrap up. Um, I just want to, I want to just give massive thanks to, to everyone involved in this session. It's been a pleasure to be part of. And yeah, Kennedy, congrats on the chairing. You made me sound much co more coherent than I was. But um, I think there's probably a whole other session on the point Rachel just brought up about like, how do we get the money to fund all these different types and ways of, of the work that we need to do and, and for it not to be about kind of like a shiny new product all the time, but it's actually a lot about like slow processes, collective, individual, how they weave together and all that sort of thing as well. That's a whole other conversation, but I think there's there's so much work to do but you know this whole conference i'm always heartened by the fact there's so many people here and interested and we'll we'll do it together somehow yeah financing a just food system is like a whole one of those um Shanae? yeah i i totally echo all of that it's it's been really nice to like just just chat through and like and see everyone's like comments as well like i feel like i'll go away from this just like feeling quite just like hopeful and like um a good a good which is a nice feeling um but yeah just and and Kennedy you're you're so good you're you're a great chair so thank you for like holding this space holding it down um and and just yeah bringing everything together so thank you for that keep being uh, fabulous everyone we will we will all get there hopefully uh, thank you everybody for being here um just to say that um, a lot's come up in this session. If there's something that's pulled your attention, like what is a procurement process? Lol, I don't know what that is. Google it. Um, just transition principle. Don't know what that is. Like Google's your friend. Um, well, in this instance. Um, and um, but just to say, like where your curiosity has landed, follow that. 
Um, Cause I know that a lot of things have come up that haven't been unpacked or you're like, what is that again? Um, are you curious about a piece of land that's down your road? Um, hit up your council, find out who owns it. You know what I mean? Follow the curiosity of where it takes you. Um, so I'm gonna hand back to Christabel um, who opened the session for us. Um, see if there's anything else that you wanna say, I don't know. Um, no, I think that was an amazing session. Thanks everyone. And um, yeah, it's come to an end. So thank you so much.